God! Wolves are dragging the body away as if to illustrate my point. Bye! Bye, Mr. Mayor! The Wild West was a place of adventure, danger, and of course, vices galore. Today, we'll explore 25 shocking vices of the Wild West that will make you question everything you thought you knew about this iconic period in history. You're shooting ironwork. Number 25. The first armed bank robbery occurred in Massachusetts. While we often associate bank robberies with the daring outlaws of the Wild West, the first bank heist occurred long before that era, in 1831. However, this initial incident involved forged keys and did not feature the use of firearms. It was a different kind of crime wave. Fast forward to 1863 in Malden, Massachusetts, where the Wild West was still far from being tame. In a deadly event that forever etched its name into the history books, the first stick-em-up, non-war-related bank robbery took place. At high noon on December 15, 1863, the Malden Bank was the stage for this shocking event. Edward Green, the town's 32-year-old postmaster, who had been grappling with alcoholism and crippling debts, walked into the bank. He was in search of change, or so it seemed. Inside the bank, only a 17-year-old boy, the son of the bank's president, was on duty. Green saw an opportunity to escape his financial woes and seized it. He left the bank, headed home, retrieved his firearm, and returned with deadly intentions. Tragically, he shot the young bank employee in the head. With his sinister deed done, Green left the bank once again, this time with a substantial haul, a staggering $5,000 in cash which by today's standards would be over $105,000. However, his newfound wealth drew suspicion, and it wasn't long before people began to question how the once deeply indebted postmaster could suddenly pay his dues. Just a month after the heist, Green reportedly confessed to the murder. In 1866, he paid the ultimate price for his crime. He was hanged. This grim chapter in history marked Edward Green as the first man to be hanged for an armed bank robbery in America. Number 24. Millions of Bison Were Slaughtered In the early 1800s, the American frontier teemed with millions of bison, their numbers estimated to range from 10 to 30 million. However, by the turn of the 20th century, this magnificent species had dwindled to fewer than 1,000. The decimation of the American buffalo was a dark chapter in history. The slaughter of these mighty creatures was ruthless, with many falling victim to the guns of individuals commissioned by the United States Army or even the Army itself. The American buffalo was a crucial source of substance and hide for Native Americans. In 1830, a disturbing directive was issued. Kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo dead is an Indian gone, proclaimed one colonel during a hunting expedition. Notably, Buffalo Bill Cody is attributed with personally ending the lives of 4,000 bison in just two years. The year 1889 marked a grim milestone with only 256 buffalo in captivity on the brink of extinction. Today, there is some hope on the horizon as the bison population has seen a resurgence, with estimates now ranging from 150,000 to 200,000. Number 23. The first train robbery happened in Indiana Let's fast forward to October 6, 1866 in Indiana and introduce you to the daring pioneers of moving train robbery, the notorious Reno Gang. This audacious escapade was about to etch their names into the annals of history. Picture a moving locomotive, its wheels clattering along the tracks as the Reno gang made their move. On board, the King's messenger held the key to the safe, and the gang wasn't about to ask nicely. They forced him to unlock one of the safes, revealing a treasure trove, $18,000 in cash, shimmering jewelry, and other valuable goods a fortune in their pockets. However, the gang's ambition was far from sated. There was a bigger safe, but alas, no key. So they took an audacious step, 
they decided to kick it off the train, hoping to retrieve it later during their escape. But their plans hit a snag. The safe proved too heavy, a ball and chain dragging them down. Two years later, in 1868, the long arm of the law, or rather the hangman's noose, caught up with six members of the Reno gang. They were captured, lynched, and strung up from a tree in Seymour, Indiana, a place that now carries the chilling name Hangman Crossing. Their final resting place is a quiet, somber spot, marked by simple graves behind a small gate. Number 22, the whiskey was terrible. Imagine stepping into a dimly lit saloon in the heart of the Wild West. You saunter over to the bar, take a seat on a rugged bar stool, and order yourself a glass of the finest whiskey that the bartender has to offer. But when that fiery liquid touches your lips, you can't help but grimace. It tastes like gasoline, and you wonder, is this really aged for 10 years and straight from the heart of Kentucky? Well, here's the kicker. Back in those days, copyright laws were more like loose suggestions and enforcing them was a wild notion. It's the frontier and there's no one around to really care. In fact, a fair bit of the whiskey being sold might have been, well, let's say creatively enhanced. It's rumored that some of those so-called bourbons were distilled from low-grade molasses. You could say that what was in your glass was a bit of a mystery. And let's not forget the colorful nickname this stuff had. They called it Coffin Varnish, Mountain Howitzer, and even Tangled Leg. Tangled Leg? Yeah, that's the kind of booze that would make your legs get all tangled up as you tried to leave the bar. It was that strong, or perhaps that terrible. Number 21, Dodge City was extremely violent. Now we've all seen the movies and watched the TV show that portrayed the Wild West as this hyper-violent, lawless paradise. But how close is that to the truth? Well, Dodge City, Kansas might have a story or two to tell. Dodge City was notorious for its violence. How violent, you ask? Well, here's a jaw-dropper. The annual record murder rate in Dodge City during its wildest years was 0.165 or 165 adults killed per 100,000 people. Now let that sink in for a moment. It means that if you were living in Dodge City from 1876 to 1885, you had a stunning 1 in 61 chance of being murdered. It was a dangerous place to call home. But to put things into perspective, let's fast forward to 2020. That year, the most violent city in the world, Los Cobos, Mexico, had a murder rate of 138 people killed per 100,000 people. Number 20, Black Bart robbed with style. Now, let's dive into a tale of a rather unique outlaw from the Wild West, a man who had a flair for dramatic heist and a way with words. His name was Charles Bowles, but he went by the alias Black Bart. Between 1875 and 1883, Black Bart pulled off some 28 stagecoach robberies, and what set him apart was his sense of style. Picture this, a man dressed in a flower sack with holes cut out for his eyes, topped off with a black derby hat and a firm grip on a gun. He wasn't your average outlaw. Black Bart had a method to his madness. He'd stand in the middle of the road intercepting stagecoaches owned by Wells Fargo and calmly instruct the driver to drop their lockbox. In one daring heist, he even had a hidden crew positioned in barrels pointing out from the bushes, ready to unleash a hail of gunfire if the stage driver dared to shoot back. The driver wisely complied and Black Bart vanished with the loot. But what truly made Black Bart stand out were the poems he left behind at the crime scenes, taunting law enforcement. One of his most famous verses went like this, I've labored long and hard for bread, for honor and for riches, but on my corns too long you tread, you fine-haired son of a beep. In the end, Black Bart was captured, served six years in prison, and then mysteriously vanished. Number 19. Women were welcome in saloons. 
While in the 1800s, seeing women drinking in bars alongside men was a rare sight east of the Mississippi River, things took a different turn out west. In the Wild West, where Puritan values held less sway, women were more welcome in saloons and watering holes. Among the women you'd find in these frontier saloons, some were prostitutes, commonly known as painted ladies, who frequented the dingy bars in search of patrons. However, not all women in these establishments were there for the same reasons. Enter the dance hall women, a different breed altogether. They were entertainers and hostesses, adding a touch of elegance and charm to the often rough and tumble saloon scene. These women would lighten the mood with their singing, dancing, and engaging conversations with male patrons, all while skillfully encouraging them to spend a little more on their drinks. According to legends of America, these saloon girls could earn a respectable $10 per week, which would be the equivalent of around $205 in today's currency, and they even received a commission from the drinks they managed to sell. Number 18. Chewing tobacco was quite nasty. In the Wild West, chewing tobacco was a common habit, and while it might seem like a peculiar pastime to modern sensibilities, it had its reasons. The arid, dusty conditions of the frontier often left folks with parched mouths, making the act of chewing tobacco a somewhat comfortable habit. The moisture from the chew provided relief to the dry mouths of those who spent their days in the open, dust-filled fields. During the 19th century, the heyday of chewing tobacco, it was not uncommon to find spittoons in many public places, including saloons, bars, stores, and even banks. These containers served as receptacles for folks to discreetly dispose of their used tobacco. While they provided a practical solution for dealing with the remnants of this less than delightful habit, the sight of spittoons filled with used tobacco was not the most pleasant one for the eyes. Chewing tobacco might have been a coping mechanism, but it wasn't without its less appealing aspects. Number 17. Bars were filled with bad quality liquor and towels full of bacteria. In the Wild West, the saloon was the heart of many communities, where folks gathered to enjoy a drink and the company of fellow frontiersmen. The atmosphere was lively, but there were some unsettling truth hidden beneath the surface. Saloons were notorious for serving a concoction known as rot gut liquor. This wasn't your high quality aged whiskey. Instead, it was a mixture of whatever liquors were on hand. Unsurprisingly, consuming this questionable brew often left patrons feeling ill. The quality of the liquor in these establishments was far from top shelf. Adding to the less than sanitary conditions of these watering holes were the bar rails adorned with towels. These towels had a seemingly innocent purpose to mop up the inevitable spills and splashes of beer. However, what many patrons didn't realize was that these seemingly harmless towels were, in fact, breeding grounds for germs and filth. Number 16. The Wild West was lawless and full of bank robberies. When it comes to the Wild West, we often think of it as a place where chaos and lawlessness reign supreme. It's a picture painted by countless movies and television shows, but the reality might surprise you. Let's start with the infamous bank robberies. While it seems like keeping your money buried under a cactus might be safer, historical records tell a different story. In fact, banks in the Old West were remarkably secure, possibly even safer than modern banks. According to Larry Swiker at the Foundation for Economic Freedom, there were only eight confirmed bank robberies between 1859 and 1900. To put that into perspective, there are more bank robberies in a single year in a city like Dayton, Ohio today than the entire Old West during a decade. So maybe those old time banks weren't such a bad place to stash your cash after all. But what about the overall lawlessness? Contrary to popular belief, the Wild West was not as wild as we often think. The rule of law was prevalent in these untamed lands. 
The Mises Institute points out that property rights were protected and civil order prevailed thanks to private agencies that provided the basis for an orderly society. These organizations, including land clubs, cattlemen's associations, mining camps, and wagon trains, played a vital role in maintaining law and order. In fact, historian W. Eugene Holland suggested that the Wild West was a far more civilized, peaceful, and safer place than American society today. Violence wasn't as deeply ingrained in the culture as popular history might lead us to believe. If we want to discuss violence in the Old West, we must look at its real source, the federal government's policies against the Plains Indians. Number 15. Not everyone was packing heat in the Wild West. The image of everyone in the Wild West wearing a six-shooter at their hip might be the stuff of Hollywood legend, but the reality was quite different. Surprisingly, the Wild West might have had stricter gun laws than some states today. Contrary to the popular perception, the Old West was not a lawless paradise where everyone was armed to the teeth. In fact, many property owners and ranchers advocated for tight restrictions on firearms because they understood that more guns in the wrong hands led to more problems. Several western towns took action to confirm firearms. Dodge City, Kansas is one of the most famous examples. The town proudly displayed a massive sign in its center that read, The Carrying of Firearms Strictly Prohibited. Wichita, Kansas went a step further in 1873, welcoming visitors with a sign that stated, Leave your revolvers at police headquarters and get a check. These towns and others had some of the most restrictive gun control laws in the nation during the frontier era, which might surprise some Second Amendment advocates today. Even sharpshooting cowboys weren't exempt from these regulations as they were often told that carrying a six-shooter was not a necessary part of their jobs. The Caldwell Commercial, a Kansas newspaper, referred to revolvers as a relic of barbarism. So, it turns out that when it comes to guns, today's America might be closer to the real Wild West than we ever imagined. Number 14. Gambling in the Wild West The Old West was a hotbed for gambling, with a peak of popularity between 1850 and 1910. Almost every town had at least one Old West bar that offered gambling games. As towns grew, Gambling tables initially went up in tents, but as money flowed in, they were upgraded to luxurious establishments like the Crystal Palace. Common gambling games of the time included faro, roulette, and poker. Men would often gamble after their workday, and some were professional gamblers. Wyatt Earp, for example, aimed to make money through gambling, and his friend Doc Holliday was a professional gambler. California gold prospectors were known for their love of gambling, and entrepreneurs capitalized on this by opening gambling houses. These establishments didn't just offer gambling tables, but also featured music and other forms of entertainment. New Orleans became the new capital of the gambling business, with hundreds of gambling saloons in the second half of the 19th century. In present day, online platforms like Instant Casino provide an opportunity to play classic games like slot machines, roulette, or poker. Gambling gradually began to attract a diverse crowd, including women, and rules were established to standardize card games. Lawmakers intervened by regulating and taxing gambling activities. Eventually, they pushed for bans on certain card games and restrictions on the gambling business leading to its decline. Saloons were keen on promoting gambling because it encouraged patrons to keep buying drinks. In some cases, bars even employed staff to maintain card tables, ensuring that customers stayed seated all night. Various games were played, and they often had humorous names like chuck a luck Three-Card Monty, High Dice, and Pharaoh. Gambling was a central part of life in the Old West as men who ventured into the frontier hoped to strike it rich quickly. The combination of a gambling mentality and the presence of firearms made for an electric atmosphere at card tables. Unfortunately, gambling disputes often led to deadly conflicts. 
arguments, cheating accusations, and misplaced bets frequently resulted in gunfights, making gambling a potentially deadly diversion in the Wild West. Number 13, the first quick draw gunfight in Springfield, Missouri. The first quick draw gunfight in the Old West occurred in Springfield, Missouri, and it was a showdown between the legendary gunslinger Wild Bill Hickok and a man named Davis Tut. This confrontation stemmed from a money dispute over gambling winnings. Tut had backed other gamblers in an attempt to clean Hickok out and force him to leave town. However, Hickok emerged victorious in the gambling dispute. Tut then demanded $40 from Hickok, claiming it was owed from a previous deal concerning a horse. According to Tom Clavin's Wild Bill, the true story of the American Frontier's first gunfighter, Hickok paid Tut the $40 on the spot, but Tut pressed for an additional $25. When Hickok refused to give in to his demand, Tut took Hickok's pocket watch from the table. The following day, Tut paraded the pocket watch around Springfield's town square on the morning of July 21, 1865. Despite Hickok's attempts to reason with Tut, the situation escalated. Just before 6 p.m., Hickok warned Tut not to cross the square with the watch, but Tut reached for his gun, and Hickok did the same. In a tense standoff, both men drew their weapon, but Hickok fired the fatal shot, sending a bullet through Tut's heart. This historic encounter marked the first recorded quick-draw gunfight in the Wild West. Word of the dramatic showdown quickly spread, and two years later, an illustration of the event accompanied an article in Harper's New Monthly magazine. Number 12. America's First Serial Killer Family – The Bloody Benders the Wild West was not just a land for gunslingers and outlaws, it also had its share of serial killers. One chilling example is the Bender family, often referred to as the Bloody Benders. This German immigrant family resided in Labette County, Kansas for a mere year from 1871 to 1872. The Bender's cabin was a sinister place that concealed dark secrets. They divided their cabin into two parts a general store, and a small lodging house for travelers. According to contemporary accounts, the family was perceived as strange, mean, or simply put off. Four Benders lived on the property, John Bender Sr. and his wife Elvira, and their son, John Jr., along with his girlfriend, Kate, who might have been his sister. The Bloody Benders are believed to have been responsible for the deaths of at least 11 individuals whose remains were buried in the orchard near the family's cabin. As more people began to question the growing number of disappearances and the eerie happenings around the Benders' property, suspicion closed in on the family. Sensing the impending danger, the Benders mysteriously vanished. Number 11. Drinking Culture in the Wild West in the Wild West, drinking culture took center stage. Saloons were the epicenter of community life and regular hangouts in every small town. However, it was primarily a male domain, as women were not allowed in saloons unless they were working as prostitutes. The atmosphere inside these establishments was characterized by rowdiness and danger. A diverse range of men, from soldiers and miners to farm laborers and even outlaws and sheriffs, frequented saloons. Many of these bars featured live music, similar to today's watering holes. Others offered card games and gambling, and some even doubled as brothels. Upstairs, working girls plied their trade while the patrons drank, and often spent more money for additional pleasures. One of the most remarkable aspects of the drinking culture in the Wild West was the abundance of saloons. For example, the small frontier town of Livingston, Montana, once boasted an astonishing 33 saloons for its 3,000 residents, showcasing the deep-seated love for alcohol in these communities. Whiskey was the drink of choice, but it wasn't the refined whiskey we know today. Number 10. Brothels in the Wild West Brothels were a prevalent and undeniable aspect of life in the Wild West. Although prostitution was technically illegal in the 19th century American frontier, this didn't deter anyone. 
with law enforcement often scarce in these rough and tumble territories, laborers, miners, and transient workers sought entertainment after long hard days, and they were willing to pay for it. In response, soiled doves and sporting women who worked in the brothels were more than willing to provide services in exchange for substantial earnings. As the West was being won, brothels evolved into central institutions in many frontier towns, much like the saloons. Migrant workers, cowboys, and outlaws frequently patronized these establishments to find companionship. For a price, pleasure was readily available, and the women who managed these operations were financially successful. It was one of the few ways for women in the frontier to earn money and exert influence in a predominantly male-dominated society. By the end of the 19th century, many boom towns made no attempt to hide their red-light districts. In a notorious example, the 1895 Traveler's Guide of Colorado explicitly listed brothels operating in the state, providing potential customers with 66 pages of information about the various establishments. It was akin to an old-fashioned Yelp, albeit with an adult focus. However, it's essential to recognize that the sex industry in the Wild West was far from glamorous. Countless women suffered and lost their lives due to childbirth and venereal diseases resulting from their work in brothels. Some fell victim to careless, violent, and sadistic men. In the best-case scenarios, a few madams amassed considerable wealth, but such success stories were rare. For many women, life in the brothels was far from ideal during this tumultuous frontier era. Number 9. Animal Fighting in the Wild West The brutality of the Wild West extended beyond the treatment of people. It also encompassed the cruelty inflicted upon animals. One disturbing pastime that gained popularity was animal fighting, including dog and cock fighting. In some boom towns, promoters went to great length to create a spectacle around these cruel events. They erected wooden grandstands to attract paying spectators, and the fighting arenas were outlined with chicken wire. Aggressive roosters were pitted against each other, leading to short, brutal, and often deadly fights. The popularity of these events was undeniable, with promoters profiting from ticket sales as fans eagerly watched animals kill each other within the ring. Gambling and alcohol also featured prominently in these gruesome affairs, continuing a pattern of vice in the Wild West. Venturing further into the Far West, another horrific form of entertainment emerged, bull and bear fighting. Pioneers in California believed that roosters and dogs were too insignificant for their tastes. Instead, they constructed large bear pits and captured California grizzly bears from the wild. These majestic bears were then forced into combat with raging bulls. These brutal battles culminated in the death of one or both animals, and the fights were shockingly violent. It's worth noting that the concept of animal fighting was not unique to the Wild West. Even ancient Romans staged similar events. However, the pioneers in California, oblivious to this historical context, organized bear and bull fights that were historically brutal. So many bears were trapped and killed in these gruesome sports that the California grizzly bear population eventually went extinct as a result of their actions. Number 8. Public Hangings in the Wild West Public executions have a long history across various civilizations. Rulers have often used them as a means to showcase the consequences of breaking the law, and the practice has a certain morbid appeal that transcends time. The lawless nature of the Old West gave rise to a similar attraction to public hangings, making them a common pastime on the untamed American frontier. Sheriffs often relied on public hangings as a way to boost public morale, especially given the often inconsistent enforcement of the law. For settlers living in remote areas without easy access to law enforcement, these events served practical purposes. Witnessing a convicted criminal being executed in the public square made their towns feel safer, and it offered a macabre diversion from their otherwise monotonous daily lives. 
In the Wild West, public hangings were elaborate and ritualistic affairs. The processions would begin at the jailhouse, with lawmen surrounding the condemned man. Meanwhile, local citizens, driven by a mix of anger, self-righteousness, and perhaps even fear, would hurl insults and sometimes even vegetables at the disgraced individual. By the time the procession reached the gallows, emotions often reached a fever pitch. There, the sheriff would read the condemned man his last rites, and a specially crafted hangsman noose made from the strongest rope available awaited. Amid a crowd that could be both cheering and jeering, the convicted man would be hanged, and with his death, a form of justice was served in a lawless place. Public hangings were a common spectacle throughout the western frontier in the 19th century. Records document dozens of legal hangings and even more lynchings. In the 1850s, one California town went as far as briefly changing its name to Hangtown to commemorate the numerous public executions that took place there. These events delivered swift and shocking justice, which found favor among the residents of the frontier. Number 7. The Shockingly Brief Gunfight at the OK Corral One can't delve too deeply into Wild West history without encountering the legendary gunfight at the OK Corral. The name alone is unforgettable, and the tale of that fateful Arizona day in 1881 has captured the public's imagination through the ages. On one side stood the Earp brothers, Morgan, Virgil, and Wyatt, alongside their ally Doc Holliday. Facing off against these lawmen were a group of outlaws and scofflaws, including Billy Clyborne, Billy Clanton, I. Clanton, and the McClary brothers, Frank and Tom. When the dust finally settled, both McClary brothers and Billy Clanton lie dead. Virgil and Morgan Earp had been wounded but survived. What makes this tale particularly astonishing is the remarkably brief duration of the confrontation. The entire gunfight involving nine men and a hail of bullets was over in just 30 seconds. Despite Hollywood's tendency to depict Old West gun battles as drawn-out affairs with men crouching behind barrels and taking cover behind walls, this showdown was astonishingly fast-paced. In a mere moment, one of the West's most infamous battles began and concluded. And here's another intriguing fact. The gunfight didn't even occur at the OK Corral, as the name implies. To be precise and precision matters, the shootout transpired at the modern-day intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street in the city of Tombstone. This location was technically beyond the corral's immediate premises, but on the public road. Even the event's name is somewhat of a misnomer when you consider these technicalities. Number 6. The Double Buried Jesse James No, we aren't talking about a Jesse James with double-barreled guns, though he certainly lived a life filled with action and danger. This story is about what transpired after the notorious outlaw's death. Following his tumultuous early years, which involved bank robberies and mayhem across the Wild West, Jesse James attempted to settle down at his homestead in Kearney, Missouri. However, there was a problem. He had made numerous enemies during his criminal career, and these foes had long, vengeful memories. In 1882, an old adversary exposed his location, leading to James's murder. Initially, James was buried in the front yard of his farm in Kearney. His family opted for this unusual arrangement because they feared that grave robbers might plunder his resting place due to his legendary status. However, this did not occur, and James's body remained there for a time. Later, his remains were exhumed and reburied in a more conventional plot at Mount Olivet Cemetery in the small Missouri town. But the story doesn't end there. In 1948, decades after the Wild West era had come to an end, a man named J. Frank Dalton, claimed to be the real Jesse James, came forward. He even legally adopted Jesse James's name. In truth, Dalton was a 101-year-old man, and the whole tale of him being the outlaw was fabricated. However, the locals in Granby, Texas, fully embraced Dalton's claims upon his death and burial there. 
They celebrated his life and the tourist attraction he represented, as though he was the legendary outlaw. The controversy surrounding the double burial sites continued for many years until DNA testing came into play. Scientists exhumed Jesse James's body in Kearney, confirming his identity through mitochondrial samples and discrediting Dalton's claims. Nevertheless, the myth had endured long enough to overshadow the truth, so many still associate Granby with the burial site of Jesse James, even though it isn't. Oops! Number 5. The West Had Real Gun Control While it's easy to imagine the Wild West as a place where firearms reigned supreme and everyone was armed to the teeth, the reality was quite different. In fact, the Wild West had a form of gun control that was stricter in some ways than modern regulations. Many frontier towns, including famous ones like Deadwood, Dodge City, Abilene, Garden City, and Tombstone, implemented gun control measures that required visitors to surrender their firearms upon entering the town. Yes, you heard that correctly. Travelers had to go to the local sheriff's office and turn in their guns. In return, they were given a token or some form of documentation representing their temporarily surrendered firearms. In a way, this early system resembled a coat check, but for firearms. There was an exception to these strict gun control rules. If you were a known resident of the town and had a good relationship with the local sheriff, you were usually allowed to keep your guns at home. The rationale behind this was that known residents, unlike unfamiliar travelers, were seen as responsible individuals who could have guns for domestic purposes and family safety. So, in contrast to popular notions of the Wild West as a place where everyone was armed and dangerous, the truth was that gun control measures were often quite strict, aiming to disarm strangers while allowing known residents to keep their firearms. Number 4. Oregon Almost Outlawed Slavery The history of slavery and its abolition in the United States is a complex and often painful one. In the context of the Old West, Oregon played a unique role in addressing slavery. Oregon state government was founded in 1844, and during its early years, it made a decision regarding the institution of slavery. Peter Burnett, one of the state's founding fathers, wrote an amendment that sought to address slavery in Oregon. The amendment declared that slavery would be illegal in Oregon and that families who brought slaves into the state for settlement had a three-year grace period to remove them from the country. If those slaves were not removed within the specified time frame, they would be considered free individuals. However, there was a significant and unsettling provision in this amendment. Section 6 of Burnett's bill stated that any former slaves brought to Oregon and subsequently freed had to leave the state immediately. The penalty for failing to comply with this provision was harsh. The freed individual would be subject to corporal punishment specifically not less than 20 or more than 39 strikes. This provision in the bill became known as Peter Burnett's Lash Law. Essentially, it intended to prevent black people, especially formerly enslaved individuals, from settling and living in Oregon. Burnett's concern was that ex-slave settlers would harbor hostile feelings towards the white population. Remarkably, this exclusionary rule remained in effect in Oregon until 1926. Number 3. Mining in Hazardous Conditions Mining has played a significant role in the history of the American West, leading to the settlement and development of many towns on the frontier. Unlike coal mining in the East, which often had grueling conditions, mining in the West often focused on gold and silver, offering the potential for quick wealth. Miners in the American West often worked individually or in small teams, driven by the allure of striking it rich. A single successful discovery could lead to a lifetime of prosperity, motivating many to venture into the mines. However, most miners did not find significant wealth and faced difficult and dangerous working conditions. As the mining industry in the West grew, it expanded to include other minerals such as iron, copper, oil, and gas. These developments provided more opportunities for profit and attracted more workers. Despite the potential for wealth, 
mining was a demanding profession with little regard for safety and miners' health. Many miners face hazardous working conditions with little attention to safety measures. Dust in the mines often led to health issues such as tuberculosis. For example, in Butte, Montana, a study found that miners were dying from tuberculosis at rates 10 times the national average, likely due to the conditions within the mines. While some miners struck it rich and changed their lives, most faced challenging and often unhealthy working conditions, putting their bodies through hardship in pursuit of wealth. Number 2. Vigilante Justice Vigilante justice was prevalent in the American Wild West due to the scarcity of lawmen and the vast distances between settlements. In many cases, serious crimes went unpunished, and the lack of formal law enforcement led to the rise of vigilantism. When crimes occurred, vigilante mobs formed and often resorted to lynching as a form of punishment. Lynchings were carried out by those who took the law into their own hands. A famous example of vigilante justice is the lynching of Bill Longley in 1878. Longley was a notorious outlaw in Texas who was lynched by vigilantes for being a horse thief. However, as the vigilantes left, they took one last shot at Bill, weakening the rope. This caused the rope to break and Longley survived, later going on to murder more individuals before his eventual execution. Criminal offenders were at risk of being lynched on the spot, sometimes merely based on accusations regardless of their guilt or innocence. Vigilantes often acted quickly and without the due process of the law, making their decisions based on perceived notions of justice. Number 1. Explorative Prostitution The rapid growth of towns and cities in the American Wild West created a demand for prostitution forcing many poor women with limited work opportunities into the trade for survival. These women were often immigrants or members of minority groups, making them particularly vulnerable to exploitation. They endured harsh working conditions, including long hours, low pay, and physical abuse. Prostitutes also faced significant risk of developing sexually transmitted diseases and being subjected to violence from customers and pimps. Exploitative prostitution was a serious issue in the Wild West, with many prostitutes being coerced into the trade due to poverty, debt, or violence. They were typically controlled by pimps who confiscated most of their earnings and used violence to keep them in line. The exploitation of prostitutes was widespread in the Wild West, and it was estimated that up to 90% of prostitutes in certain areas were victims of trafficking. The lack of effective law enforcement in many areas and the tolerance of prostitution by authorities contributed to the problem. Despite the dangers, some women chose prostitution as a means to earn more money than they could in other jobs and to have some control over their lives. There you have it guys, 25 Wild West vices that'll make you see this iconic period in a whole new light. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel for more fascinating history, and ring the notification bell so you never miss out. Thanks for watching.